All right, well, let's read the passage that we're looking at this morning, Romans 15, verses 5 through 12. So a little smaller passage. Uh, might say diving a little more deeply into this uh, than the broader ones. Uh, sometimes when, when Paul speaks about one issue, he can go on for a couple of chapters. Like we saw last time, we covered all of chapter uh, 14 and part of chapter 15, but now he's turning to give to us uh, a prayer and an example uh, that has to do with what we've just seen. But again, you can only, you can only do so much in, in a sermon. So we're going to maybe dive a little bit more deeply into this one. So let's first of all read it, Romans 15, verses 5 through 12. Paul writes, Now may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant you to be of the same mind with one another according to Christ Jesus, so that with one accord you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, accept one another, just as Christ also accepted us to the glory of God. For I say that Christ has become a servant to the circumcision on behalf of the truth of God to confirm the promises given to the fathers. And for the Gentiles to glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, therefore I will give praise to you among the Gentiles and I will sing to your name. Again he says, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples praise him. Again, Isaiah says, there shall come the root of Jesse and he who arises to rule over the Gentiles in him shall the Gentiles hope. Okay, Gentile salvation was not a mystery in the Old Testament. No, quite, quite clearly it's here. And by the way, I hope you remember the Gentile simply means not a Jew. Okay? It's talking about the nations. Uh, sometimes we think Gentile is a certain class of people, you know, maybe just this group of people. But it's everybody who's not a Jew, and that means, I think, all of us. You know, we, we were not Jewish. Now, in, through Christ, we have become Jews. <laughs> uh, we are the true Jews, the true Israel of God. But um, again, this is talking about what the nations were prior to faith in Christ um, and how the Lord has accepted us uh, and how we need to accept others. All right. So last week, Paul, remember, was showing us the proper use of Christian liberty where the Lord gives no specific instruction, such as whether, you know, if we're going to eat a piece of fruit, whether it should be an apple or an orange, or what color, uh, color clothing we should wear, okay? Well, there's no specific instructions. We're at liberty to do what we want to do. But Christian liberty also covers those areas where he has told us what his will is, but there's still disagreement because, you know, there's um, the weaker brother, or sister, um, who may not believe they have the liberty to do these things. And he brought up two examples, whether to eat meat, and he's talking about meat offered to idols or only vegetables. Some who came from an idolatrous background had a difficult time eating meat, sacrificed to idols. Well, Paul tells us that that's really not an issue, but if it's an issue for you, you shouldn't do it. And also the Jews that came out of the, you know, the Jewish tradition, some of them still felt compelled to keep the ceremonial days. And so they wanted to elevate those days while others realized they were liberated from those things and they didn't keep them, and particularly Gentile Christians. So where there are these differences of agreements, uh, Paul is saying, first of all, we need to do all things in faith. We need to make sure we have the freedom uh, to do this, and we also need to be careful not to stumble each other with our freedom. You know, as I was thinking about this, it reminded me of something that John Frame taught us in one of my seminary courses that was, I think, quite helpful. When he said that, that a person, a Christian, can be convinced intellectually in their minds, you know, the arguments are persuasive, that something is true. And take, for instance, the meat offered to idols. We can become convinced that that is true, that we can do that. Or that we can drink wine in moderation. You know, a lot of folks come from a background that, where they believe the Bible teaches that alcohol is absolutely wicked. 
and you should never ever have anything to do with it. Well, you know, but then they have to come to grips at some point with the fact that the Bible does say that we can drink wine as long as we don't become drunk. But you reach that stage where you're intellectually convinced, but you're still not settled. You don't feel settled about it. It just doesn't feel right. And maybe it's because of the way we were raised. You know, I was raised in a very strict non-alcohol family. Maybe it's because of the church, you know, that we were a part of and, and that was their conviction. Or maybe because on our reading of Scripture, that's the conclusion we came to. And the same thing can be true about the things we believe regarding God and regarding salvation. You know, perhaps some of you come from a background that, uh, you know, is what we call Arminian, where, we be, where you know, Arminians believe that we're all free to choose what we want to. We have moral liberty and don't really understand the bondage of the will that sin brings us under. And, uh, you know, we don't see how much God is involved in, in our salvation. And then we become convinced of the fact that God is absolutely sovereign in salvation. But there can still be time that passes between our being convinced in our minds and being settled in our hearts before we fully embrace whatever truth the Bible has that may be contrary to what we have believed. Paul is telling us that we need, first of all, to make sure that we wait to act on those beliefs until we reach the stage where we are settled, not just convinced, but settled in our hearts. Now, the stronger brother has reached that point, but the weaker has not. And so he's saying we need to be careful not to judge or criticize each other as long as we're in that situation. As those who are stronger, we need to be careful not to stumble the weaker, which means not to encourage them to do something that they haven't yet settled in their own hearts is the right thing to do, but instead set our liberty aside, the thing we feel we have the freedom to do, just don't do it in front of those people that might be stumbled or offended by it, but instead do the things that make for peace. So now this morning, Paul is following up on those things and he is praying that God would give the Roman believers, would give to us because we're in the church as well and we need to do this, the strength to be able to do these things, to accept those who disagree with us. And then he points to Jesus' example of his being a servant, both to Jews and to the Gentiles, to encourage them or to encourage us to do this very thing. So first of all, we see Paul's prayer that God would strengthen them, that he would strengthen us to do these things and note that the world might see the difference, the Christ makes in our lives. You know, no one's ever going to be convinced that Christianity is true unless it changes us somehow, <laughs> unless it makes us different than they are. And the difference that they need to see most of all is the fact that we can get along, that we love each other. Now, last week, Paul already pointed to Christ's example, that Jesus didn't live for himself, but he set aside his own pleasure that he might honor his Father. And the interesting thing is Paul pointed out that, that Jesus would do that even in the Old Testament, even before he came into the world to show both Old and New Testament believers or Old Covenant and New Covenant believers how we should live, that we should not live for ourselves, but we should use what God has given to us, even our liberty to serve one another. And I thought it was interesting because that means... As the Old Testament looks forward to Jesus and, and shows us what Jesus was like, Jesus was our example, Jesus was our model, even before he came into the world, even before he was born. He has always been that image of God, what God desires of us. And that by following his example patiently, even the Old Testament example, and receiving the encouragement that God gives us in his word through his promises, Paul said we could have hope. The hope that, that we belong to Him. The hope that we are safely in His kingdom and that we have heaven to look forward to. But now Paul's point this morning is this. Now that Jesus has come and given to us a clearer example, okay? Remember that fulfillment of prophecy is 2020. 
You know, those were types and shadows. You know, John Owen has an interesting way of describing these things in his book, The Glory of Christ. He talks about how in the Old Testament, you know, they have this this, um, real dim view of the glory of Christ through the types and shadows. And then Jesus comes, and, and in the gospel, we get this clearer view, but Paul says we're still looking through a glass dimly. And in heaven, we, we see that full glory of Christ. Well, we have that clearer view through the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that is what Paul says and prays, that we would have the strength to be able to follow, to follow him. He prays, first of all, to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is our Heavenly Father, who is the source of all perseverance or patience, and the one who gives encouragement, again, through His promises, that we would be of the same mind with one another. Literally, He means think the same thing. Now, we have to be careful because that almost sounds like what He's saying is that we need to agree on everything the Bible teaches. Now, I think we do. I think that's important. But I don't think that's what he, is, he has specifically in mind right here. But let, let's just pause for a minute and think about what that would do for the church. You know, if we all agreed, well, how, you know, how this would go a long ways toward creating what it is that the Lord wants for His church, that we would have if I can use the word doctrine, okay? Doctrinal unity, which simply means we all agree on what the Bible teaches. Now, doctrinal unity is, is very important. That's, that's the reason why churches have statements of faith, okay? Is so that those who are part of it, whether officers or members, would know what they believe regarding the Bible. Now, I'd like to say it doesn't eliminate disagreement, but it, it does have a tendency to reduce it. You know, it's interesting, uh, Bob Godfrey in his series on American Presbyterianism points out that uh, as, as the, uh, the old school and new school uh, developments take place within Presbyterianism, okay, and the idea is we're going to cling to the old truths or we're going to compromise some of those for the sake of unity, well, that compromise has, has gone on for quite some time To the point where, as Bob Godfrey points out, um, if you ask a church for what they believe, they might hand you a paragraph today or maybe one sheet. You ever looked at a statement of faith, you know, for various churches online, you'll see maybe maybe something would fill one sheet of paper. That that can be good and, and it can be bad. Depends. But Reformed churches, Presbyterian churches would tend to hand you a book of confessions and catechisms and, you know, that, that has a fuller expression of, of what it is that, that the Bible teaches, okay? Now, I'd like to say that, that if we all agreed on all those points that are in that book, that we wouldn't have any disagreements, but <laughs> sadly, that doesn't happen. We still have disagreements, but this reduces it. Now, let me just mention one other thing about this. Uh, Rob, you know, again, Bob Godfrey in his series on American Presbyterianism and Revival, which you can access uh, on Ligonier's website, points out that the Dutch and German Reformed churches for membership require absolute agreement on everything that's contained in their confessions and their catechisms. Okay. Both of their office bearers, I should have pointed out in Presbyterianism, that's not the case. Just, just the office bearers okay, need to agree, and even they can vary in some places. But not so in the Dutch and German Reformed denominations. You have to agree on everything that's in their confession, everything that's in their catechism, whether you're an office bearer or a member. If you, you don't agree with it, you can't join. I remember talking to some people who wanted to join the URC church and they differed on just one point, and they wouldn't let him come in. Okay, so what do we think about that? Well, again, it may reduce the disagreements, you know, that might crop up in, in the church life, but sadly, it also excludes genuine believers from being a member of a church that might actually do them some real good if they join it because they're preaching the truth, right? 
Now, that's a problem. It excludes true believers, but what does that say about what Jesus prayed for and what, um, what we're looking at in our text this morning where we're supposed to accept and love one another, receive one another? This tends to eliminate, you know, again, true believers. And I think the confessions are so full. There, there's just so many things you could disagree on in, in there. I, anyway, I think it's problematic. Now, the Presbyterian Church, I'm not just trying to crack up the Presbyterian Church, but let me just say that if someone holds the fundamentals of the faith, you know, they, they're trusting in Christ, the true Christ, the only way of salvation, by, and Him alone for their salvation, and they're following Him, they can become a member, even if they disagree with, with our distinctives, as long as they promise not to undermine, you know, not to divide the church with their disagreements. So all this is to say is that doctrinal agree agreement can help. It helps if we agree on what the Bible says. But Paul has something more ultimate in mind here. He says that we be the same mind with one another according to Jesus Christ. And the same mind is not necessarily the same belief system, but it's thinking about each other in the same way. This is how he explains it in his following exhortation that we accept one another as Christ has accepted us. If we're acceptable to Him, we should be acceptable to each, to each other. Now again, Paul is referring to the stronger and weaker brother, and he's telling us that we are to love each other as Christ has loved us, whether or not we agree on every doctrine or on all matters of Christian liberty. Now why is that important? Okay, well, I've, I've already told you, it's much more important than we usually think. In our text, Romans 15, verse 6, Paul tells us that we cannot honor God unless we do this. Paul writes, so that with one accord or with one mind, you may with one voice, and he doesn't mean here just speaking, but the witness or the testimony that we give of the Lord that we may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now think about it in these terms, that the work of redemption, the salvation that, that, our, that God gives us through Christ, it, it's meant to reconcile us to God. Okay? That part of it's clear. But it's also to reconcile us to each other. Okay? It's meant to reverse the effects of the fall, the most obvious effect being that of hatred, and division. Remember what the angels said uh, when Jesus was born, peace on earth? <laughs> that there be peace between us and God and peace between us and our neighbor. His kingdom is a kingdom of peace. He wants us to be unified. So if we are to glorify the Father, we need to show the world that He accomplished what He set out to do, that we become one. <clears throat> Remember what Jesus tells us in John 13, verses 34 through 35 that we read for our meditation. A new commandment I give to you that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. You see, if you don't have love for one another, the world isn't going to know that we belong to Christ. Now, Notice Jesus calls this a new command, but this isn't really a new command, is it? Because in the Old Testament, God told the Jews, love your neighbor as yourself. I mean, that, that's what the, um, the second you know, group of six commandments and the Ten Commandments is all about, that we love our neighbors, we love ourselves. But the new part of it is this, that we love each other as he has loved us. You see, we have failed to love one another as we love ourselves, and we don't even really know how to do that because we don't love ourselves the way we should, but Jesus does. And so His example is what we are to follow. That's the reason why Sinclair Ferguson believes that that commandment would better be stated, and he can say that on the basis of what Jesus says here. Love your neighbor as Jesus loved His neighbor because He is the only one who has done this right. So if we do this by the power of His Spirit, whose fruit is love, 
all men will know that we are his disciples and the Father will have the most powerful apologetic possible that his gospel is true. So that's the prayer Paul has for the Romans. That's the prayer that Jesus prayed for his church and not just for his disciples who were alive then, but for everyone who would believe in his word, that we would be one even as he and the Father are one, one in purpose because of the love that binds them together. We are to be one, uh, accepting one another, loving one another. Okay. Now, the second point here is that Paul exhorts them then to do this very thing based upon Christ's example. Verse 7, Therefore, accept one another, just as Christ also accepted us to the glory of God. Now, he's been talking about serving our brothers and sisters by accepting those who disagree with us on matters of Christian liberty. But now he's pointing to Christ's example, that we should accept each other as he has accepted us. Now, what did Jesus do? Well, first of all, Jesus served his people. Remember, the Jews are his people. He came to his own, but his own did not receive him, sadly. Okay? But he came to his own to serve them, to confirm the promises that God had made to them. You know, the Abrahamic covenant that through his seed all the nations of the earth would be blessed, that was passed on to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob so that God might receive his people. Now, Paul's already explained this in Romans chapters 9 through 11, how God adopted the Jews as his sons and daughters, how he made his gracious covenants with them, and how the point of those covenants was the promise to send the Messiah into the world. And he did send the Messiah. And even though they didn't all receive him, most of them didn't, just very few did, Paul was arguing that that did not mean that God's promises to the Jews had failed because they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel, which may sound kind of strange, but what he is saying is that the, the Israel that he came to save is not made up of all the natural Jews. It's, not, it's made up of some of them, and then he's going to go on to argue it's also made up of Gentiles, not all natural Israel is elect Israel, as he argues in chapter 9, God chose Isaac, but not Ishmael. He chose Jacob, but not Esau, that Moses says he raised Pharaoh up to display his power and his glory, and then goes on to say, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. Jesus served his chosen from among the Jews. He has become a servant to them, doing what was necessary to make them acceptable. Now, that is perfectly clear. But the important thing to see here is that he has also served the Gentiles, those who couldn't be any more different than the Jews. Now, this may not be very, you know, so apparent during his earthly ministry. There are really only a few instances where his path crossed the Gentiles' path. But it became much more evident after his ascension when he sent his disciples to preach the gospel, not just in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, but to the furthest reaches of the earth. In other words, go out to the Gentiles, go out to the nations and preach the gospel to them. Now, this is what God said he would do in the Old Testament, and I'm not going to read these passages again except to note this. And I think Paul did this on purpose, that these quotes, there's four of them, that they come from the three sections of the Old Testament. You know, the law, the prophets, and the writings, simply to show us that the entire Old Testament, God was showing us that this was his intention to reach the Gentiles. So Jesus has also become a servant to the Gentiles that they might also be accepted by God and glorify him for his mercy. Jesus of course, accepted the Jews. I mean, that was the plan all along, to send Jesus to the Jews. He is their Messiah. But to the Gentiles, okay, he has received them, accepted them as well, and they have been, as we're going to see this evening, reconciled into one body, okay? Now, uh, what, he is, what Paul is doing by giving us this example is calling us to do exactly the same thing to accept one another regardless of how diverse we might actually be. 
Now, he says, all mankind, both Jews and Gentiles. Now, we're, we're used to that. I mean, we're in, we're in the New Covenant era. We're, we're Gentiles, and we usually don't think about these distinctions much anymore. You know, it seems kind of strange, you know, kind of rare when you see Jews saved. It seems like it's mainly Gentiles. So, no surprise, we don't have any difficulty accepting Gentiles because we're Gentiles. But we can put this in terms that's a little bit more relevant, I think, for us. We should accept those from non-Christian backgrounds as well as those from Christian. Yeah, I think we tend to be more comfortable with people who come from a church background, don't we? Because they tend to be more like us. And hopefully that means they're more like Christ. You know, that, that's the ultimate goal. But we see Christ in those. It's not hard to receive them. But we need to accept those who haven't you know, come from those backgrounds as well. They're still rough around the edges, so to speak. We need to accept those who view the Scriptures as we do, okay? People from other Reformed denominations, but we also need to accept those who see it differently. You know, that, like I said, that, that could be a hard lesson for some people. I, I know that uh, in the past, I've learned some hard lessons as I've tried to push people maybe too quickly in one direction. We've had, you know, when we were a little bit larger and we'd have visitors, uh, sometimes somebody would come in with a differing belief and then one of our members might attack them, you know, and say, why, how could you possibly believe that? Well, you know, we need to be careful. You know, as long as they hold to the fundamentals, we need to love them, we need to receive them, we need to you know, be patient with them as we study together. How long did it take us to come to our convictions? We need to study together to know the mind of Christ. You know, we need to try to agree as much as we possibly can, and that takes time. But we also need to agree to disagree when we can't do that immediately and still love and accept one another. We need to accept those who come from our ethnic backgrounds, you know, again, familiarity, and those from other cultures. You know, we're, we're more comfortable with the familiar. And by the way, every, with, if you looked at all the things we have in common with all the cultures of the world, I'd say we probably have much more in common than we're different. But sometimes it's hard to accept the unfamiliar. But we need to accept it. Because really, most of these cultural differences are not moral issues. If there are moral issues, then you know, we need to be careful about those. We need to help them find their way out of them. But if they're not moral issues, if they're just simply different ways of doing the same thing, they're matters of Christian liberty. So we need to accept one another, regardless of our cultural differences. And, and missionaries know that very well, don't they? They need to be very careful that they love and accept those that are so different, especially <laughs> when you go to, to areas where the, the dress code is so different. You know, you, you, you just you got to do what you can to be careful and to accept and to love, right? We have to love those and accept those who have been down a hard road and those who haven't, again, remembering that it takes time for true believers to grow. If somebody comes into the congregation with tattoos all over, maybe on their faces even, you know. Yeah, they come from a, a rough background, but still need to love and accept them if they're trusting Christ. And if they're not, we need to try to lead them to Christ. Those from a wealthy background, those from a poor background, James tells us we're not to show favoritism to any, Okay. We need to extend to each other the love that Jesus has shown us. To glorify God together with one voice so that loving each other, we may honor God by showing the world that the gospel really does make a difference. So that they can see the answer to Jesus' high priestly prayer. When he says in verses 20 and 21 of John chapter 17, I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. Well, may the Lord answer this prayer in us. May he give us patience. May he give us encouragement. May he help us to love the example Christ gives us and to follow that example by the power of the Holy Spirit, really loving and accepting.
all true believers in Christ and even loving those that don't know Him and seeking to bring them into the kingdom. Well, let, let's bow in prayer. Let's ask the Lord to help us uh, to do this.